Now that we've mastered the Lewis structure and can tell where electrons will be situated in a molecule, we can extend it a little bit further into what's called molecular geometry. And geometry is just, in a chemical sense anyway, is how and why these molecules take these shapes. Um, boron trifluoride is this uh, thing in the lower left-hand corner, and it's actually an example of a flat molecule. But you'll notice there that the angles of the BF uh, kind of angles there, they're about 120 degrees. So like if you were to draw BF3, you probably wouldn't draw it like that, but that's the way it actually is. <laughs> All right. And then up here in the upper left is an example of a carbon uh, around methane, CH4. Uh, carbon here is actually kind of in a funky thing. This is called a tetrahedron. And you can see ammonia and the other ones in there. So the geometry is something that is an extension of a Lewis structure. And so knowing how electrons are placed around an atom, you can actually make sense of these different forms. The theory that's used to describe geometries as applied to Lewis structure is called VESPER. And that's nothing you need to know or memorize, but VESPER stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. And if you have a central atom and it's connected to two other atoms, the bond angle is going to be a reflection of those electrons trying to be as far apart from each other as they can. So as an example of this, uh, uh, beryllium difluoride has a BE in the middle and two Fs. And each of those lone, those, uh, excuse me, those single bonds or sigma bonds, those are basically just like big clouds of electrons. And electrons, which are negative, try and be as far apart from other electrons as they can. And the farthest they can be apart, but still have the BEF2 molecule would be 180 degrees. And this is very common. If you have a central atom with with only two atoms around it, it will always take on this 180 degrees. And you can extend the two outside atoms to three outside atoms to four and stuff like that using Vesper. So watch this little video and see the different forms you're going to take. In Chem 222, we're going to look at geometries where the central atom has between two and six atoms around it. According to VSEPR theory, the valence pairs surrounding an atom move to positions that minimize their repulsions. It all comes down to electrons trying to stay as far apart from each other as they can. And most of these are st somewhat straightforward. Okay, no big deal. The one that's going to be really weird is the tetrahedron, and I'll highlight that here in a little bit. But before we do that, I do want to highlight here, make an advertisement for, the Geometry and Polarity Guide. And this is something that's on a website and also in the companion. The Geometry and Polarity Guide is going to have lots of the terms used under VEST for the different geometries, and it's a really good guide to look at. In addition, there's going to be information on bond angles and polarity, which we'll talk about later. So it's a pretty cool guide. I highly recommend you having a printed copy that you can look at next to you while you're doing problems in labs and stuff, because uh, we're going to use that quite a bit. So let's look a few little bit more examples of how these geometries work out. If you have a central atom and two atoms outside it, so for example, beryllium difluoride, I talked about either earlier, that each of those BEF single bonds, the lines we draw, are again basically just electrons, and they want to be far apart from other electrons as much as possible. So the geometry that's taken then is where the F BEF angle is 180 degrees. And this makes what's called a linear geometry. And any time in chemistry, as far as we've ever seen, where you have a central atom and two outside atoms, they will want to take the linear geometry to get them 180 degrees as far apart as possible. If you have three outside atoms around a central atom, as an example, boron trifluoride we've seen earlier, 
then those three F atoms are going to try and be as far apart from each other as they can. Because again, each of those BF single bonds is like an electron cloud, and the clouds want to be as far apart from the other clouds as possible. So to evenly distribute the clouds, you can put them in what's called a trigonal planar geometry. And that means that each FBF angle is 120 degrees. And as a quick reminder as to circles, by the way, a circle is 360 degrees. So if you have three 120 degrees angles, that's going to be 360. In the linear one above it, you'd have two 180 degree angles for 360. Oh, math. Anyway, sometimes trigonal planar is called planar triangle. I prefer trigonal planar, but honestly, either one is totally fine. This is the one you really want to watch for when you have four atoms. <clears throat> when you draw a molecule like CH4, which by the way is methane, you would draw it probably like this. All right, this is pretty sloppy. Sorry about that. That's oh, maybe make that a little bit better. H. There we go. You draw it like that and it looks flat. All right, like the carbons in the middle of the paper screen, whatever, and the hydrogens are at 90 or 180 degrees from each other. And that sounds cool. However, the way that I just drew it, all of the angles are 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And the 90 degree orientation causes more friction than if you could get to 109 degrees. And in a tetrahedron, where you make the tetrahedral geometry, you don't have 90 degree angles at all. You actually have 109. Mathematically, it's like 109.5. You can call it 109. That's fantastic. But anyway, the tetrahedron is what happens when a central atom is surrounded by four external atoms. And this is very, very common in chemistry. What I want to highlight here is that um, it's not a flat molecule. You don't have 90 and 180 degree angles. All of the angles are 109 degrees. That's the difference between a tetrahedron and then the kind of flat two-dimensional kind of structure I tried to draw right there. So one central atom, two outside atoms, linear. One central atom, three outside atoms, trigonal planar at 120 degrees. One central atom, four outside atoms, tetrahedral with angles about 109 degrees. So let's go back to the ammonia structure we drew e earlier, and that's the Lewis structure for ammonia. That's the electron dot structure slash Lewis structure, nitrogen with a lone pair, three bonding pairs to hydrogen, nitrogen has the octet, etc., etc. To use the Vesper rules, we need to figure out how many clouds are around the central atom. And a cloud can be a bonding pair or a lone pair. So in this molecule for ammonia around the nitrogen, there are three three bonding pairs and one lone pair for four pairs total. That's the whole octet thing, of course. Four pairs is always going to take on the tetrahedral geometry. So you can think about it as the three lone, as the one lone pair and the three hydrogens as each being one of the corners of a tetrahedron, all right? There'll be a tetrahedral geometry. So we would describe the ammonia molecule with the electrons showing as tetrahedral. We're going to start calling the geometry where the electrons are present as electron pair geometry, or EPG. And EPG is just saying that, hey, those electrons are there. They're having a presence and stuff like that. We probably wouldn't see them if we could get down to this molecule because electrons are shimmering and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the electron pair geometry would be tetrahedral. We also know they're there because the angles are all about 109 degrees. Sometimes, though, it's nice to think about what the molecule would be like knowing that the electrons are there, but knowing they're invisible. So the little animation on the right with the blue nitrogen, <laughs> all right, you can see it rotating round and around. That's also ammonium. And on top of the blue angle, uh, the blue atom, is the invisible lone pair. It's exerting a presence because it's pushing those hydrogens into 109 degree angles with each other, uh, but it's not actually something you would see. We're going to call this kind of geometry a molecular geometry. 
And an electron pair geometry, if you will, is like the base way to figure these out. A molecular geometry is like a subset depending on number of lone pairs around the central atom. So we would say that ammonia has an electron pair geometry that's tetrahedral, and because it has one lone pair, the molecular geometry would be called the trigonal pyramid. These kind of names are in this geometry and polarity guide, so hopefully you can start seeing the utility of using this uh, sooner more than later. Water, H2O, is one that's also, of course, super important for the Chem 200 series. When you draw the Lewis structure, and this would be a good thing for you to do on your own, you'll see that oxygen is in the middle, hydrogen's on the outside. Remember, hydrogen's never in the middle part of the atom. So even though it was listed first, hydrogen's too electron uh, lame, if you will, to handle being in the middle. So we're going to put those on the outside, two lone pairs on the oxygen, two bonding pairs to hydrogen. Oxygen has an octet, etc., etc. We're good to go. But let's figure out now the electron pair geometry. And like before, we're going to count the bonding pairs plus lone pairs. So oxygen has, which we're figuring out the geometry for, by the way, the central atom. Oxygen has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs. That's four pairs total, or four clouds. That means this is going to be another tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Anytime you have four bonding pairs plus lone pairs total, it's going to be tetrahedral. Um, a caltrop, <laughs> pictures in the lower right hand corner there, uh, is what one of my students wanted to call the tetrahedron all the time. So that's kind of an homage to uh, that student, which was really cool. But anyway, neither here nor there. You can imagine then that in the middle of the caltrop right there, that's the oxygen. Uh, here's one hydrogen, here's the other hydrogen, and then the lone pairs take up two of those four spaces, all right? That's what the red things are there on the little picture on the right. So you, whether you use a caltrop or my tetrahedral thing, uh, either way is totally fine, EPG tetrahedral for water. But if you realize that those lone pairs are quote unquote invisible because they shimmer, they've got uncertainty with them, all that kind of stuff, then the HOH molecule looks kind of like a V, all right? Um, it's a molecular geometry for this thing is called bent. So water is not HOH in a line. Water, HOH, has an angle about 109 degrees, all right? And so we refer to the electron pair geometry of water as tetrahedral the molecular geometry is bent. Both of these terms are going to have uses for it. Electron pair geometry is arguably the most important. Every, all electron pair geometries that are tetrahedral, for example, are about 109. From the electron pair geometry, you can figure out the molecular geometry. So for example, ammonia had one lone pair. That molecular geometry was trigonal pyramid. This uh, water has two lone pairs. Molecular geometry is bent. If the molecule has no lone pairs, then the electron pair geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. So CH4, which we talked about earlier, has no lone pairs around the carbon. EPG and MG are both tetrahedral. Based on Vesper, which of the following corresponds most closely to the molecular shape of SCL2? And I put in a Lewis structure there for you. Now, molecular shape is an alternate way to call some things to figure out a molecular geometry. So for your purposes here, molecular shape and molecular geometry are the same thing. To answer this question, we're going to look at the central atom, which in this case is sulfur. And sulfur Sulfur here has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs, four pairs total, okay? And four pair totals has, if you remember from the last slides, an electron pair geometry, which is tetrahedral. So we would describe the sulfur as having an electron pair geometry, which was tetrahedral. And if you remember, the angles around that are about 109. But we're not after the electron pair geometry, we're after the molecular geometry or molecular shape. 
So if you look up in the geometry and polarity guide, or just kind of remember from water, this is an example of a bent mo uh, molecular geometry. And it's bent with 109 degrees or 109.5. There's actually two bent molecular geometries. The other one is for when you have a trigonal planar geometry with one lone pair. Uh, that's a different thing. We'll see that more later in the future. But for right now, the molecular geometry, which is the same as molecular shape, comes from electron pair geometry, tetrahedral. Tetrahedral with two lone pairs is bent. Bent is the answer, but this is bent with 109 degrees because again, tetrahedral always have about 109, 109.5. Methanol is part of a family of organic chemicals called alcohols. Alcohol, of course, in popular culture has a reference, you know, -hoo, just say no kids. But anyway, um, there's actually a class of compounds in organic chemistry called alcohols and methanol is one of them. And we'll talk about this more in the organic chemistry chapter coming up. But anyway, methanol is CH3OH. First thing in this problem, let's draw the Lewis electron dot structure. Now, hydrogen won't be in the middle. So CH3 is actually pretty common in chemistry. CH3 we're going to call a methyl group. Carbon is connected to three hydrogens, that's the H3 part, and then the fourth part will be connected to something else. So if you play with this for a little bit, this is the structure you're going to get. The CH3 is on the left, the carbon is connected with a single bond to the oxygen, oxygen has a hydrogen on the other side, and two lone pairs. All the formal charges are zero, stuff like that, cool. The second part of this question though is something new, it says define the bond angles around one and two. Two. Okay. To figure out bond angles, you need to know what the electron pair geometry is around the central atom. So around angle one, which is HCH, we want to know the electron pair geometry of carbon. Carbon has four bonds around it. Anything with four bonds, tetrahedral, and anything tetrahedral, about 109 degrees. 109.5 is fine. All right, no problem. Um, the oxygen, we're going to do the same thing. Now, oxygen has two lone pairs and two single bonds, so that's four clouds total. And you guessed it, four clouds, tetrahedral. And you guessed it again, tetrahedral, about 109. So around both of those angles, the HCH angle one and the COH angle number two, both of them are about 109 degrees. And the little animation there on the lower right shows methanol rotating around. You can see that all of those angles angles about 109. But we can figure that out through the Lewis structure. And both the carbon and the oxygen had four clouds, four pairs of electrons around it. Carbon was four bonding pairs. Oxygen was two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. It is all the same. They are both tetrahedral. Acetonitrile is CH3CN. Now, CN is an example of what's called the cyanide molecule connected to a methyl. When you draw the Lewis structure out, this is a carbon nitrogen triple bond. And so the question is here define bond angles one and two. Well, one is probably looking pretty familiar to you. Number one is the same as we had with methanol. Instead of a CH3 connected to an OH, this is a CH3 connected to a CN. But regardless, angle one, that carbon in the middle, is four bonds, so that's going to be tetrahedral. But angle number two is different because angle number two has a single bond on one side and a triple bond on the other. And for reasons which I will explain more in the next chapter, a triple bond, or a double bond for that matter, counts as just one cloud. So around this carbon, you've got one cloud single bond there and one cloud right there triple bond right there that's two clouds two clouds is going to be linear so the CCN that angle number two with two big clouds that's gonna be hundred and eighty you don't break doubles or triples into two or three bonds it's just one big bond here it's called lumps I pre kind of prefer clouds these days but same thing two clouds far apart as possible, 180 degrees, good to go. And again, so doubles and triples count as one big cloud or one big lump and you don't break them up.
All of these rules can be applied to molecules with more than or less than f the octet rule. So the ones that go less than four, boron, beryllium, gallium, aluminum, etc., and the ones that go more than four, which are basically period three and lower. Again, the ones that go less than four are usually group 3A, that's boron, aluminum, sometimes gallium. It can also be beryllium though too. The ones that go more than four are usually the third period and higher. So third period, fourth period, fifth period, never second period, never first period. So let's look at boron trifluoride. Boron trifluoride, like we've seen it already a lot of times, is boron with three fluorines around it, okay? If you have three uh, three atoms around a central atom, those three are going to be as far apart from each other as they can, and that's the trigonal planar geometry we talked about earlier. Sometimes trigonal planar is called planar triangle, that's fine stuff, although I don't like it as much. Um, around the central atom with three outside atoms, the angles will will be 120 degrees, all right? So no big deal. So pretty much the same as before, only we're going to have just different combinations. According to VSEPR theory, the valence pairs surrounding an atom move to positions that minimize their repulsions. In the previous discussion, we talked about uh, how with two outside atoms around a central, it would be linear, and with three outside atoms around a central, it would be trigonal planar, four outside atoms around the central, it would be the tetrahedron. But now we're talking about five and six pairs around the central atom, which are totally doable too, but we just have some new terms associated with them. If you have five atoms around a central atom, this is what they call the trigonal bipyramid. And the trigonal bipyramid is a real interesting kind of molecule. Trigonal bipyramid is essentially the trigonal planar in the middle. So remember the boron trifluoride we saw earlier? That was basically flat 120 degrees. Well, this triangle right here is basically a trigonal planar geometry. But in the trigonal bipyramid, you've got one atom directly above and one atom directly below. So when it comes to bond angles with these, you've got to think about the 90 degree angles, like the top relative to one of the ones in the triangle plane. You also have to think about 120 degrees, the ones that are in the plane. And once in a while too, it's a good idea to think about top versus bottom, which is 180 degrees. So trigonal bipyramid is what you have when there's five uh, outside atoms around a central atom. And we will see several examples of this in this course. With six pieces around a central atom, then you go to what's called an octahedron. And an octahedron means that literally they're pushed as far apart as you can from each other. If you've ever played jacks, jacks are basically things you throw on the ground and you scoop them up and this, anyway, it's silly. It's kind of silly, but it is kind of fun. But anyway, I digress. A jack is really like a type of an octahedron where the middle part of the jack is the central atom. And then you've got six pieces around it and stuff in an octahedral form. Uh, all of these angles are 90 degrees with the exception of, of course, directly across from each other, which would be 180 degrees. So this is an area which is new for Chem 222 relative to the Chem 100 series, uh, five pieces trigonal bipyramid and six pieces octahedral. So let's go back to sulfur tetrafluoride, SF4. Um, if you count up the number of valence electrons, fluorine is seven, seven times four, 28, plus sulfur six, 34 valence electrons, that would be 17 pairs. Sulfur's in the middle, fluorine's on the outside, connect the outer fluorines to the sulfur with a single bond, lone pairs around the outside atoms first, giving them all octets, and if you have any left over, put them on the inside. Well, sulfur has one on the inside, Inside, and that's what makes this one different. So sulfur is connected to four fluorines and a lone pair. So this is when we're going to start kicking in the trigonal bipyramid. There's five clouds around that central atom. 
four clouds, if you will, the flooring and one lone pair, there's going to be 90 degrees, 120 degrees, and 180 degrees. Lone pairs deserve a little bit of a comment here. Lone pairs are very finicky and they're very actually big. They look small in a drawing, but they're actually really big. And your structures will be better by making fewer 90 degree angles. And the fewer angles you can have at 90 degrees with a lone pair, you're gonna do better. So really on this molecule, you could put the lone pair in the central part, the trigonal planar part, which is how it's drawn right here. But you could have also put a lone pair on the top, <laughs> all right? But you don't wanna put one on the top because a lone pair on the top would give you three 90 degree angles. And if you put the lone pair in the middle like that, uh, you're only going to have two 90 degree angles. And that sounds really finicky, but it's actually something that's observed. The fewer 90 degree angles to other atoms, the better. All right, better to have 120s, that, like two 90s instead of three 90s, I guess would be the way to do it. This is a trigonal bipyramid electron pair geometry. And if you look in the geometry and polarity guide, having one lone pair makes this have a seesaw molecular geometry. And you kind of have to use your imagination here. Now remember that there's like an invisible lone pair right there, all right, but people don't see it. The seesaw comes from the fact that it kind of looks like the thing maybe you played on as a kid or maybe you have kids, you've watched them, and you you know, like one person was on each side and it would go up and down and stuff. And I was always the heavy kid, so it wasn't any fun for me. But anyway, that's a long story, neither here nor there. The seesaw is the molecular geometry for it. Um, I put this structure up here for a reason in this example because you'll do a lot of these and anytime you have carbon, carbon like CF4, that's always gonna be tetrahedral. We're gonna see a lot of tetrahedral things. However, sulfur has two more electrons than carbon. That's why you've got this trigonal bipyramid slash seesaw just Make sure you count your valence electrons and you'll have no problem. This slide shows the other names associated with the trigonal bipyramid electron pair geometry, and depending on number of lone pairs, you can find the molecular geometry name from there. Um, on the far left, you would have zero lone pairs. And if you have zero lone pairs, the name is the same for the molecular geometry and the electron pair geometry. So PF5 has no lone pairs on it, just fluorine atoms. That would have trigonal bipyramid for both the EPG and the molecular geometry. If you add one lone pair, you'll go to this one. So in this one, this is the SF4 we just looked at. That's when we get into the C saw. And if you have two lone pairs on the central atom, you end up with a T shape. If you have three lone pairs, you're going to have the linear geometry. But notice this is not the linear electron pair geometry. This is a linear molecular geometry based on trigonal bipyramid. Down below is the equivalent for the octahedral. On the far left, zero lone pairs. Octahedral would be both the name of the molecular and the electron pair geometry. If you have one lone pair, i.e. this one right here in BRF5, that makes a square pyramid molecular geometry. So in this case, BF, BRF5 would be an octahedral electron pair geometry, and the molecular geometry is square pyramid. And then finally, if you have two lone pairs, then uh, from the octahedral, you're gonna have those lone pairs be opposite each other. 180 degrees. You don't want to have lone pair, lone pair 90 degree angles. That just breaks the molecule apart in this case. So in this case, then you've got lots of 90 degree, degrees to atoms, but no other 90 degrees to lone pairs. That's the square planar molecular geometry from octahedral. So again, start using the geometry and polarity guide as soon as you can to become familiar with these names. A molecule has five electron clouds. They could be pairs and or atoms around a central atom. And the molecular geometry is linear. 
how many lone pairs are present on the central atom of this molecule. So this was one of the examples uh, given just before I covered it up here. Oh, fascist chemist. Anyway, <clears throat> in this case, you have five pairs. So that's going to be an electron pair geometry of trigonal bipyramid. <laughs> five clouds means trigonal bipyramid. And if the molecular geometry is linear, linear you want to get the lone pairs as far apart from each other as you can. So you're going to have a linear molecular geometry if they're directly across from each other, 180 degrees. So if you remember the trigonal bipyramid, it was something like a trigonal planar in the middle, and then there was a central atom above and a central atom below. And if it's linear, this angle, top to bottom, those are all going to be filled in by atoms. So that means you're going to have a lone pair there, there, and there. On the trigonal planar, three lone pairs are necessary to create a molecular geometry which is linear in an electron pair geometry described as trigonal bipyramid. So again, you're seeing how electron pairs on these can be a little funky, but if you follow the patterns in those last examples, you'll be totally good to go, or the geometry and polarity guide. Bond order is worth talking about as well. Um, bond order is just nothing more than the number of bonds between a pair of atoms. And it's so easy, it's hard. This is, uh, by the way, acrylonitrile, a molecule from organic chemistry. And what the arrow is pointing to there is a carbon-carbon single bond. Single bonds always have bond orders of one. So that carbon-carbon bond order is just a bond order of one. Double bonds have a bond order of two. So if you see a double bond, write the bond order of two. And finally, you can probably imagine if you have a triple bond, that's going to be a bond order of three. So in this molecule, there's quite a few bond orders of one. There's a bond order carbon-hydrogen right there. There's a bond order carbon and hydrogen there. Bond order carbon and hydrogen there and the bond order of one between carbon and carbon. Then there's one bond order of two and one bond order of three. Literally, number of bonds equals the bond order. Formaldehyde is given in the lower right-hand side there, and it says what's the carbon-oxygen bond order in formaldehyde? And you can see the carbon is the kind of gray slash black atom, and oxygen is the red. So it literally count up the number of lines between the carbon and the oxygen. I see two lines. That means this is going to be a bond order of two. You can have bond orders of 1.5 and 2.5. I'll show you that in a little bit. A bond order of zero does doesn't make any sense because that would mean there's no glue, if you will, between the atoms and the atoms would just float away from each other. So a bond order of zero wouldn't be reasonable. The other ones we're going to see are possible. You can have a fractional bond order like the 1.5 or 2.5 I showed earlier if you have a resonating structure. So here's the resonating structure for nitrite, NO2-1. It's not nitrogen dioxide neutral. This is nitrite, NO2-1. This is diamagnetic. Everything is paired. But you can see there's a choice where the double bond goes. It could go on the left or it could go on the right. So bond order for resonating forms, you take the total number of electron pairs used in that resonating bond and you divide them by the number of places they can go. So whether you use the left or the right, there's a total of one, two, three bonds. All right, three lines. That's the three that goes right there. And those three lines are either here between the left and the right and an O or here between the middle and the right NO. So there's two places they can go. So three pairs divided by the two places they can go, this is a bond order of 1.5. Most of the time bond orders are ones and twos and threes, but if you have something that resonates, then you can get into 1.5s, etc., etc. Bond order is pretty simple, but it does relate to two things which are really useful, and those are bond length and bond energy, okay? And formaldehyde is shown again on the right-hand side. Notice that there's some numbers that are in picometers, PM, and there's also some energies, kilojoules. Bond length is what they're looking at when it comes to the picometers. So the carbon-hydrogen bond length is 110 picometers, and the 
carbon-oxygen double bond, 123 picometers. But there's also some bond energy values. The 414 kilojoules is the energy to break a mole of carbon-hydrogen single bonds. It's endothermic. Bonds don't break by themselves, but if you add 414 kilojoules per mole, you'll break it apart. The carbon-oxygen double bond takes 745 kilojoules to break up a mole of carbon-oxygen double bonds. We're going to see that bond order can be related to both bond length and bond energy, which is pretty cool. When it comes to the bond length, <clears throat> bond length is inversely proportional to the bond order. So what that means is as bond order goes up, the bond length goes down. Or if your bond lengths are getting bigger, your bond order is going down. And that's kind of a cool thing to know. Now, for this particular problem, all right, we're looking at three different hydrogen with halogen molecules, HF, HCl, HI, all right? If you remember from Chem 221, as you go down the periodic table, atoms get bigger. Atoms get bigger generally as you go left and down. So iodine is a lot bigger than fluorine. And notice how the size between the hydrogen and that halogen is getting bigger. So F is the smallest, smallest bond length. Chlorine's in between 1.310. Oh, and by the way, these are angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, so pretty small lengths, okay? But HCl is bigger, longer than HF, and HI is even bigger yet. As bond order goes up, your bond length goes down. That's what it said on the last screen, and this is a better example to show what's going on. The upper left-hand corner is methanol, and methanol has a CO single bond, and that's 1.410 angstroms. Carbon dioxide has a C double bond O, a carbon oxygen double bond. And carbon monoxide, lower right, has a C triple bond O. So you see you're going from a bond order of one to a bond order of two, and CO down here, bond order of three. As your bond order goes up from one to two to three, the bond length goes down, 1.4 to 1.3 to 1. about two. Uh, that's what it means as bond order goes up, your bond length goes down and vice versa. So think about that. As bond order goes up, your bond length goes down. And that's kind of, that's kind of a neat thing. So uh, bond order 1C single bond O will be longer than a C double bond O bond order 2. And a C double bond O will be longer than a C triple bond O uh, with a bond order of 3. The energy of a bond indicates its strength and is measured as the energy required to break the bond. This table in the upper right are literally the energies required to break those types of bonds. So if you start in the upper left, a CH single is 413 kilojoules per mole to break up, carbon-carbon single bond 348, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of interesting. But Notice here how you can make some connections. So like the CC, the first one we just talked about, that's a carbon-carbon single, a bond order of one. And if you go down here a little bit farther, here's a carbon-carbon bond order of two, a double bond. And here's a carbon-carbon triple bond, bond order of three. So notice the energies are going 348 to 614 to 839. The energy required to break them is going up as bond order goes up. So when it comes to bond energy and bond order, we say that as bond order goes up, the bond energy, the energy required to break the bond, also gets larger too. And you'll see that for lots of different things. You can also do that for carbon-oxygen. Uh, it goes from 358 to 799 to 1072. Now notice it's not like exactly two times the single bond equals the double bond. It's not quite that simple. But we can say on a relative scale that as your bond order goes up, the bond energy, the energy required to break the bond, goes up as well. But remember too, as your bond order goes up, the bond length goes down. It's a really interesting thing. So that's why, again, bond order goes up, bond energy goes up, but bond length goes down.
Oxygen, dioxygen, has a double bond when you draw out its Lewis structure. It has a 498 kilojoule per mole energy, and the length between the oxygen atoms in O2 is about 121 picometers. Now, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, when you draw out its Lewis structure, oxygen, oxygen, single bond. Notice the bond length, all right? We went from a bond order 2 and O2 to a bond order 1 and H2O2. Bond length got larger. So bond order went down, bond length goes up. On the other hand, the bond energy went from 498 kilojoules per mole to just 210 kilojoules per mole. So bond order went down, the energy required to break the bonds went down too. So remember, bond order goes up, bond energy goes up, bond length goes down. Ozone is O3, and ozone is a resonating structure. It goes double on one side and single, then it goes double on the other and single on the other. Notice how the bond length is between the double and the single bond orders, all right? And that makes sense because the bond order for ozone would be the three bonds divided by the two places it can go, bond order 1.5. And if you had to make a guess as to the bond energy, you'd say it was between 498 as a high and 210 kilojoules per mole as a low, somewhere between them. Now I'm guessing because the bond length is much closer to the double than the single, I would guess that the energy to break ozone would be somewhere closer to 498 than 210. But that would be the best guess I could do. We should look that up or of course do it in experiment and stuff to figure it out. You can use those bond energies in some kind of cool ways. So let's say you wanted to figure out the energy of this reaction, which is H2 plus Cl2 making 2 HCl. Well, you can use those bond energies to actually figure this out, which is really cool. The net energy, the delta H, remember delta H is the sign for enthalpy. Enthalpy here is the energy required to break bonds minus the energy evolved when bonds form. So Here's kind of the punchline that I like to use. I like to use that the energy equals bonds broken minus bonds formed. And in a reaction like this one, what you're going to do is you're going to break the HH bond and you're going to break the CLCL bond. But then you're going to form two HCl bonds. So these are the numbers from that table we saw earlier. Bonds broken would be the HH plus the CLCl bond. And then to figure out bonds form, minus bonds form, minus two times this number right here. It's pretty cool. You never have to memorize any of those numbers. Hydrogen and chlorine react to form hydrogen chloride. Because the total energy of the broken bonds is less than that of the bonds formed, the overall reaction is exothermic. So the video there just said that it's exothermic. Exothermic means the delta H value will be negative. A positive delta H would be an endothermic. That means energy has to be given in. But let's confirm it. Let's confirm that it really is an exothermic reaction. So again, it's bonds broken minus bonds formed. So if you add up the bonds that you're breaking, that's HH and CLCL, that comes out to be 679 kilojoules. That's the bonds broken. Now bonds formed, we're forming two HCl bonds. So 2 times 431, the value there, is 862. Then finally, bonds broken, 679, minus bonds formed, 862, that comes out to be negative 183 kilojoules. So sure enough, this is an exothermic reaction. Energy is given off when the HCl is made. The last topic we're going to talk about in this section is the topic of polarity. And polarity is a really interesting result of knowing how the electrons are distributed in atoms, and the effects can be quite drastic. And I'd like to show you two examples of how important polarity is. The first one is to compare water, which is H2O, there on the left side, we saw its bent structure earlier, and methane, CH4, which is basically the main ingredient of natural gas. Now, 
uh, water is about 18 grams per mole and methane CH4 is about 16 grams per mole and we're going to see in a future lecture that boiling points are basically the factor of a couple things but one of them is the molar mass the more molar mass harder to boil but water and methane are about the same molar mass but there must be something else going on because water boils at a hundred degrees Celsius which is where we kind of expect it because we do a lot with water methane on the other hand doesn't uh, boils at negative 161 degrees Celsius so about 260 or so degrees difference in the boiling points and again this isn't from mass because the masses are about the same all right so why do water and methane differ so much the other thing is that why does water dissolve ionic compounds so well? We saw in electrolytes how water can dissolve strong electrolytes into cations and anions, kind of surrounds them and stuff like that. Well, the answer to both of these questions comes from a discussion of the polarity of the molecules. And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. Some molecules have even distribution of electrons around them. Some have, though, an excess of electrons on one one side or the other, causing these effects to happen. When the balloon is rubbed with wool, the wool imparts a static electric charge to the balloon. When we place the balloon near the water, the stream is attracted to the balloon. The polar water molecules act as though they have an electric charge as well. Water molecules carry no overall electric charge but they do exhibit polarity. The positively charged end of the water molecules and the negatively charged balloon attract each other. If you remember the structure, the Lewis structure for water, it was basically H and then there was the bent HOH and it was bent because on the oxygen there were two lone pairs. Now water doesn't have a positive or a negative charge like a sodium plus or a Cl minus, something like that. But these two lone pair electrons give it kind of like a quasi electric charge and that's a slightly negative side. But because the molecule is overall neutral, that means the opposite side, i.e. the side with the hydrogens, you have a slightly positive side. So on the animation on the right, that balloon had a slight negative charge, and you can see how the hydrogens there are aligning themselves towards the negative balloon. Positives and negatives attract. On the other hand, the oxygens, which are somewhat negative, are trying to get away from the negative charge. This is a result of polarity. It's unequal distribution of electrons and molecules. A better, sometimes I think, analogy is if you're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you only put the peanut butter on like half the sandwich, right? You haven't spread that peanut butter all the way through. If you don't spread the peanut butter all the way through, you have a polar peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If you spread it all the way through, then it's a non-polar thing. By the way, you can do this experiment Experiment, but you have to use a very thin uh, stream of water. Don't like have the you know faucet go full blast and expect for it to do it. Um, but if you have a very uh, a very very narrow stream of water, you can make the balloon actually pull it over. It's kind of cool. Polarity, then, is just an unequal distribution of electrons. So, for example, in H and Cl, Cl has three lone pairs and hydrogen doesn't have any. So chlorine has a lot more electron density around it. We would call it polar because there's a positive end and a negative end. And each of those is like a pole, a positive pole or a negative pole. And because there's two of them, it's a dipole. So HCl is polar with a positive and a negative. And notice the notation here. Um, if the, the slightly positive side gets a delta plus, so hydrogen is somewhat positive, the slightly negative side gets a delta minus. That little symbol there is a lowercase uh, delta. <clears throat> so the chloride with more electron density is delta negative, and the hydrogen here would be delta positive. 
This arrow system is also used. The positive, uh, the, po the left-hand side of, if you will, the arrow is like a little positive symbol. That's the positive dipole, and the arrow points towards the negative dipole. And you can do this for all of them. Um, polarity, uh, you can do a lot with vectors with, if you get to higher courses. Um, vectors are used in math sometimes to represent direction. And vectors come in really handy when it comes to polarity in higher chemistry courses. But for right now, we'll just kind of talk about it in a vague sense. Chlorine has a slight negative charge or a delta minus, and the hydrogen has a slight positive charge, which would be delta plus. And again, sometimes you'll see that arrow system all means the same thing. You can actually measure the polarity, and you measure the polarity through something called a dipole moment. And dipole moment gets the symbol mu. If you have a nonpolar molecule and you place it in an electric field, the molecules don't align themselves. That's because in the case the green molecules on the right, the dipole moment would be zero. There's no interaction, no difference in polarity. On the other hand, if you have a polar molecule, then the negative side of the molecule will align towards the positive and the positive side of the molecule will align towards the negative. So I know from the diagram on the left that the white triangle represents the negative dipole and the blue triangle represents the positive because positive is pointing towards the negative side of the field and the negative uh, right there would be pointing towards the positive. So polar molecules have measurable dipole moments and there's machines that can do this and stuff which is pretty cool. Nonpolar molecules could care less. They just float around like nothing was happening. Now, an interesting thing happens. Because of polarity, the HCl bond strength is quite a bit larger than we'd expect for a regular HCl. So a regular bond, a regular HCl, they feel would be about 339 kilojoules. But in the real world, when they measured it, it was more like 432 kilojoules per mole to break HCl. So there's a lot more attraction. And that's because the H and Cl can combine a little little bit with an with another CLH. So you can see the H and the CL then are opposites and this CL and H are opposites. I like to think of polarity as being a kind of a stickiness. The HCLs are sticking more to each other than we think and that's why the energy is a little bit higher. The difference between what they feel it should be and what actually it is, that difference is related to something called electronegativity. And electronegativity gets this symbol chi. Looks like an X, you can use an X, but it's technically chi. Anyway, electronegativity is really useful. Electronegativity does describe polarity, but it also can be used in Lewis structures. We'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a polarity guide in the companion and online if you'd like some more information on it. This is a table showing the relative values of electronegativity. And what's really important to us is that fluorine in the upper right hand corner, that's the most electronegative element. The noble gases aren't usually included here because they don't usually make compounds and they're kind of boring, all right? But if you think about it, this is another periodic trend. Electronegativity increases up and to the right. So if you look in the group 1A on the left side, francium to cesium, terbidium to potassium to sodium, they're slowly getting bigger as you go up. And as you go right, they slowly get bigger until you get to fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative element of all. And that's why fluorine as an oxidation number in a compound was always negative one because it's the most into electrons. It attracts electrons, if you will, better than anything else. Oxygen is second to fluorine, 3.5. Nitrogen and chlorine about the same. You can always look back on this table, but it's also kind of nice to know that fluorine is the most electronegative and roughly it increases up and to the right. I assumed that I knew what a polypeptide chain looks like except for the way in which it's folded. And I wanted to fold it to form the hydrogen bonds. I had a cold. I was lying in bed for two or three days, and I read detective stories, light reading and for a while, and then I got sort of bored with that, so I said to my wife, bring me a sheet of paper, and I'm going to, I think I'll work on that problem of how polypeptide chains are folded in proteins. So she brought me a sheet of paper and a slide rule and a pencil, and I started working.
Well, uh, I succeeded. It only took a couple of hours of work that day in March of 1948 for me to find the structure called the Alpha Helix. Linus Pauling discovered that protein molecules have a helical structure. If we remove the hydrogen atoms from the model, we can more clearly see that the molecule twists around itself, rather like a spiral staircase. The helical structure allows a very large molecule to occupy a relatively small space. Linus Pauling is a real interesting person. He uh, grew up in Oregon. Uh, he went to Oregon State, the equivalent at the at that time, and uh, he ended up getting his PhD. And he, he's just incredibly he has two Nobel prizes prizes in both chemistry for the chemical bond as well as in peace. And he was banned from going to other countries for a while because he was considered an international flight risk and stuff. So um, his vitamin C stance is still quite interesting. But anyway, uh, for this purpose right now, he was the one that came. Came up with the idea of electronegativity which we're going to use quite a bit and electronegativity led to the development of the alpha helix uh, which was really cool he's a pretty cool and interesting person but what we're using here is we're talking about his electronegativity studies electronegativity has been updated to a different version but we're using the traditional electronegativity values um, the new system is still controversial so let's uh, talk about that at a different date but in the regular version which is still very well accepted. Fluorine again has the maximum electronegativity and in a Lewis structure, this is important, the atom with lowest electronegativity is the central atom. So up until this point we've been saying like, oh, you know, it's usually the first atom listed and stuff like that's the central atom. Well now we can say definitively that the central atom is the atom of a lowest electronegativity. As long as it's not hydrogen, right? Hydrogen's kind of a freak unto itself because it only has one bond. It can make. But anyway, everything else, the central atom is the atom of lowest electronegativity. So it's pretty important. But in addition to that, relative values of electronegativity, i.e. comparing one atom to the other in electronegativity, can determine bond polarity. And bond polarity is one way that chemists use to dis understand why certain types of molecules will attack a second molecule and why other ones won't. So this is just a question you might come up against. You don't have a table, but it does say which of the following groups is arranged correctly in order of increasing electronegativity. Now again, the goal here is to figure out electronegativity. If it's increasing, it increases up and to the right. So you want the most down and to the left atom, all right, to start with, and you go to the most up and to the right. And we talked about how fluorine is the most electronegative element element of all. So if fluorine's one of them, then the answer has to be A or C. It wouldn't be aluminum because aluminum is certainly not up and to the right at all, but fluorine is. So if you look on the periodic table and you go up and to the right, aluminum is under boron. So aluminum would be first, boron would be next, oxygen more to the right of boron, fluorine the most electronegative of all, answer C. This question goes into more about the relative values of electronegativity. And it says, which bond is more polar? Which one has the biggest difference in the dipoles, i.e. the dipoles being positive and negative? So if you look up the value of electronegativities I showed earlier, oxygen is 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1, and fluorine is 4.0. Now, some interesting things from that. The first of all is that the relative uh, electronegativities is that delta chi. And you can see the OH has a bigger delta electronegativity, 1.4, than OF's 0.5. So one thing we would say is that the OH bond is more polar. It has a bigger separation of electronegativity values. But there's another thing you can pull out. The bigger electronegativity value will be the negative dipole. So on OH, the oxygen 
oxygen is the negative dipole. Hydrogen is the positive, oxygen's the negative. This is what we saw with water. But with OF, it's reversed. Fluorine has a higher electronegativity, so fluorine is the negative dipole. Oxygen is the positive dipole. So there's two things you can glean from these electronegativity values on this problem. First of all, OH is more polar. It's got a bigger positive-negative separation, if you will, than the OF does. OF would be closer to a pure covalent bond, which has really small delta chi. But the other thing that's really cool is that on OH, the oxygen is the negative dipole, but on OF, the oxygen is the positive dipole. Bigger electronegativity, negative dipole, smaller electronegativity, positive dipole. Which of the following pairs of bonded atoms would you expect to have the greater bond polarity? Okay. Now, if you look right away at the bottom, you've got fluorines. And it might be tempting to say, oh, yeah, fluorine, most electronegative and stuff. Okay, that's cool. But if you're looking for greatest polarity, you want the biggest difference in electronegativities. And fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4, which is huge. But 4 minus 4, guess what? Zero. So E is not polar at all. It's actually nonpolar because delta chi is zero. So how you want to answer this problem is you want to find the two atoms which are furthest apart on the, on the periodic table. And usually that's a great answer. A better answer would be to go through and find all the individual electronegativity values and find the difference between them. But using the first way I mentioned, K and F are pretty far apart on the periodic table. So my money would be on answer B. And sure enough, that's it. N and O are uh, pretty close to each other. That's probably not it. N and B, not too far. S and Cl, not too far. FF, like I said, are right next to each other. Most of the time, the atoms which are furthest apart from each other will be the most polar. A molecule will be polar if... A, the bonds are polar. You have to have bonds that are polar, difference in electronegativities, and the molecule is not symmetric, and this is worth discussing. Now, first of all, we've been talking about bond polarity, and every time you have a delta chi, a change in electronegativity that's basically bigger than zero, all right, you're going to have a polar bond. However, you can have symmetric molecules where all of the polar molecules uh, can cancel each other out. These are examples of molecules with a central atom, but everything around the outside is the same. So for example, on the linear example on the left, you'd have something like beryllium difluoride, beryllium in the middle, fluorine on the outside. Let's use that as an example. Beryllium is probably like me if I'm going to try and wrestle with someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> who's one of my heroes, actually, just to be honest. But anyway, let's say that Schwarzenegger is one of the fluorines, all right? Well, Schwarzenegger, even as he's older, is like so tough in my mind. He would totally take me down, <laughs> all right? It would be no problem. He could like pull on my hand and it would pull off. I, I think of Schwarzenegger as really cool, obviously. But anyway, I digress. The fluorine beryllium is also really polar. Brilliums almost is basically a metal. Fluorine's super non-metal. Fluorine's pulling really hard. However, there's another fluorine pulling on the opposite side. So earlier I said how Schwarzenegger could pull my hand right off. It's probably true. Let's say Schwarzenegger had a twin and his twin was just as strong as him. Either a clones, that would probably be a better way. So Schwarzenegger and his clone are pulling, but they're pulling on 180 degrees apart from each other. Their pull is going to cancel out. Now, in chemistry terms, the fluorine is pulling electron density towards itself big time compared to beryllium. But the pull to, say, the right side is canceled by the pull to the left side. So if you have a symmetric molecule, and these are all examples of symmetric ones, by the way, where everything around the central atom is the same, no lone pairs, no fluorine versus chlorine, I mean, everything is the same, those are going to be nonpolar. So BEF2 
is nonpolar. Each FBE bond, very, very polar, but they're 180 degrees from each other, so they cancel each other out and they're all nonpolar. Boron trifluoride is an example of three around a central atom. It's nonpolar. The next one would be CF4 or CH4. Again, as long as everything is the same, then it's going to be nonpolar. An unofficial hint is that if you have to guess, <laughs> and this is always dangerous to say, especially as an instructor who's supposed to know better than to tell you these things. However, if you have to guess, guess polar, because there's a lot more polar things out there than there are nonpolar. But I'd like to show you the official rules for finding nonpolar and polar before you have to guess. Yeah. So let's compare carbon dioxide and water, which one is polar, okay? So first, you gotta draw out the Lewis structure, figure out the geometries, stuff like that. Well, carbon dioxide, carbon in the middle of two double-bonded oxygens, we saw that had formal charges of zero. Water, on the other hand, has a tetrahedral electron pair geometry and a bent molecular geometry. Well, CO2, the carbon-oxygen bond, has a delta chi, which is pretty good. I think oxygen is three, 3.5 and I think carbon is like 2.5. So the difference between those 3.5 minus 2.5 is one. That's pretty polar, but they're 180 degrees from each other. So they cancel out. CO2 is nonpolar. It has polar bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar. Now, water, on the other hand, doesn't even have the symmetry thing going for it. Remember, water has two invisible lone pairs on it. It's tetrahedral. Those angles are 109 degrees. This isn't symmetric at all. The oxygen-hydrogen is polar. It's got lots of lone pairs. This has polar bonds and it's a polar molecule because not everything is the same. Lone pairs are different than atoms. They are not the same. So as long as everything is different, you will have a polar molecule. All right, let's play the polar nonpolar game now for these molecules. Boron trifluoride, Cl2CO, and NH3. These are all what they call AB3, where there's a central atom with three different atoms around the outside. So first thing, big surprise, draw a Lewis structure, figure out geometries, blah, blah, blah. Well, all of these have three, cent or three atoms around a central atom. Uh, however, they're all quite different here, you can see. BF3 has very polar boron boron fluorine bonds. I think the difference in electronegativity is like 2.0, which is pretty strong for electronegativity. However, the boron is symmetrically distributed with fluorines. There's no lone pairs, everything's trigonal planar, stuff like that. This molecule is nonpolar. So BF3 has very polar bonds. BF is very polar, but because it's symmetric, nonpolar molecule. You would not be able to measure a dipole moment around BF3. Now, Cl2CO, when you draw it out, has a carbon-oxygen double bond and two carbon-chlorine single bonds. And right away, you can see that everything around that carbon is not the same. You've got two Cl's and a double bond O. That certainly are all different things. That's going to be polar. All right, you have a measurable polarity around that, which is kind of interesting. And ammonia, although it looks like it's a central atom with three atoms around it, there's that invisible lone pair. And again, that breaks the symmetry. So ammonia also is not a symmetric molecule. It's going to be polar. And you can see it's 1.47. The lone pairs on top of that nitrogen kind of give it an electron kick. So that's why it's a little stronger, I would argue, dipole than the Cl2CO. But kind of cool to think about. All you need to worry about is symmetric or non-symmetric for the molecular polarity. So BF3, symmetric molecule, just fluorine around boron, nonpolar. But the other one's definitely asymmetric, and that includes the lone pairs on ammonia, polar. Which of these molecules is polar? Okay, so the very best way to do this, mo this problem would be to draw out Lewis structures for the first four there and see if any of them are polar or if they're all nonpolar. Now, BCl3 is gonna be very similar to BF3, a boron in the middle of three halogens. Instead of fluorine, it's chlorine. We saw that BF3 was nonpolar, BCl3 nonpolar as well. 
CO2, we also saw earlier, carbon in the middle of two double bond oxygens, 180 degrees from each other. CO2, symmetric, that's going to be nonpolar as well. Now, if you have two atoms, the same kind of atoms next to each other, uh, those are automatically going to be nonpolar because two atoms are going to be pulling equally. On this particular molecule, I do recommend drawing out the Lewis structure. There's going to be a triple bond between the nitrogens, and each nitrogen has a lone pair. But again, nitrogen pulling on nitrogen, that's a symmetric fight, no big deal, nonpolar. The last one, though, Cl pulling on F, well, those are different kinds of atoms, that's going to be polar, no question. Cl pulling on F is not, there's no way that that's not going to be anything but polar. So D is definitely a polar molecule because you have different kinds of atoms. And please notice that Cl and F, it's not Cif. You can't have a Cif, but you can certainly have a Clf. If you're having difficulties recognizing Cl, and CI, you are always welcome to ask me, and I will tell you if it's CL or CI, but this one's definitely CLF, just letting you know, polar. This is a series of complexes that go from one symmetric molecule to another. So on the left-hand side, you have CH4, which is a carbon symmetric with hydrogen all the way around it. And you can see there's no dipole moment. It's nonpolar. On the far right, you have CCl4, which is also symmetric with only chlorines around the carbon. Again, that's nonpolar because everything around it is the same. So the left is nonpolar, the right is nonpolar, but everything in the middle is polar. That tetrahedron, if you add one, two, or three of different kinds of atoms, you're going to make it polar. Remember, it's a tetrahedron. It's not flat, all right? So you can't have like two atoms cancel each other or anything like that. Everything in the middle, quite polar. Only if it's symmetrically distributed by the same kind of atoms will it be nonpolar. So this is kind of a cool guide to see how this stuff all works out. All of these molecules are nonpolar due to their symmetry, all right? And that's another thing. If everything in the molecule is the same, then it's also going to be nonpolar. So notice like on ethene right there, you could have like a sheet of glass go through the middle, and it would be the same both left and right. That's going to be nonpolar. Same thing here for acetylene, like a thing of glass through there. You can draw lines of symmetry through all of these different things, and they're going to be the same. Same. So we're going to build on our knowledge of polarity a lot more. Um, ferrocene, the lower uh, middle one there, is an example of an organometallic compound. It's a compound with a metal, iron, connected to a carbon. We're going to see this is a way to represent different carbons. It's pretty cool. Uh, ferrocene uh, revolutionized organometallic chemistry in the 1950s or so. That's for a future discussion. But anyway, again, iron in the middle of those two things, that's non-polar. Pretty cool how this stuff all works out. So polarity becomes pretty important when it comes to being a scientist. That's the end of chapter seven. I just want to review real fast. Um, if you need um, additional studying, I do recommend, of course, that you look at the textbook. The study guides in the companion and online are bulleted lists of the important concepts from each chapter. I recommend you go through the bulleted list just to make sure you're kind of up to speed with what it's talking about. The concept guides, also online and in the companion, are uh, worked examples from the different chapters. And so if you're not sure how to do bonds broken minus bonds form, look in the concept guide for an example. It'll show you in detailed steps how to go through it. Um, I won't show it in this video, but if just pass this on the uh, chapter notes for this chapter um, or in the online version of these notes, there are a couple of additional pages in the lecture notes themselves. The first one is important equations, which is kind of things um, that help you through this different chapter. And then after that, there are some chapter problems. Again, questions on one slide and then the answers on the next. I suppose I should show you since this is the first lecture, so let 
me do that. Um, here's an example of the important equations. And again, these are kind of just bulleted lists and stuff like that. Different things from the lecture we just went through. Make sure that you're good to go on these different concepts. And then finally, after that, in relatively small font, don't expect to read it here, but you can get a bigger version online. Here's a series of questions. There's eight questions here. Try to answer these questions on your own first. And then if you get it, you can check your answers to the answers on the next page. So definitely look at these. They'll all help you get ready for the material if this is all stuff you can do. If you do have any questions at any time, never be afraid to reach out to me uh, through email is the best way. I can hopefully try to help you out. If you get stuck on a problem, you can take a picture of it and send that to me as a screenshot or something. That's a really cool way to do it. You can also talk to the Learning Success Center slash Avid Center at Mount Hood Community College. They can help out too. There's lots of ways to get assistance. Don't feel like you have to do this on your own. Okay, rooting for you all the time. Let me know if I can help and good luck with your studying.